Okay, sovereignty, latitude, and free will of man. Trinitarianism versus modalism. Well, let's just define all these. Uh, Trinitarianism is that there is one God in three persons. And the, the scriptures, by the way, Trinitarianism, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The, the Trinity part right here, that's not in the Bible. It doesn't say that anywhere. Like rapture, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Uh, neither is covenant of works and all the other things that theology has. Um, but that God exists in three persons, I'll show you, it's all the way through the Bible. Modalism is saying that modalism is a kind of an accommodation to the word Trinity not being in the Bible. And, and the best way to say it is that there's one God, modalism says, with three hats. And so he can only be one God at a time, or there's only one of him, and so he wears the Holy Spirit hat, and then he wears the Jesus hat, then he wears the Father hat. So there's never all three of them. Doctrine, theology says that they're co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial. Um, in other words, they're, they're all existing equally, all three persons, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three persons are existing all at the same time. It's not he's God for a little while, becomes the Holy Spirit for a while, and he becomes the Son for a while. Modalism was one of the um, heresies. In fact, all of church history, um, uh, I love the history of doctrine. In fact, one of the best ways to understand biblical doctrine in the early days of the first century and second century, they didn't have time to write theologies because they were running for their life. That's why I was just lecturing on in ancient Rome. They were in the catacombs. Uh, Nero was dipping. He would attach Christians. He would tie them to sticks, and they would dip them in tar, and then they would, you know, up to here, and they would put the stick in his garden, and they would light the stick and let it burn, burning the person to death, to light his banquets. You don't have much time to write books if you're running from being dipped in tar and burned. And so how we establish theology is looking at the apologetic. When, when a heresy came, like the one I told you about this morning, um, Mithraism, the Son of God's blood makes us born again, what they did is they wrote an apologia. Apo means against in words. So they, they did an apology against a heresy. They didn't write down a lot of theology, but they would strike out at things that are erroneous. And so if you study the heresies of the ancient world, the responses to the heresy become the theology that we piece together. And so one of the apologies was against this modalism, and modalism is part of the the struggle the early church had with a pendular swing between believing in the full deity of Christ and the full humanity. And what, what happens is the, the early church would swing. You know, a lot of us think the early church, everybody just was hunky-dory. They all believed the same thing. They struggle. The early church struggled. They didn't, have, they didn't have pastors that could spend enough time to study and write because they were running for their lives. Um, one of the Roman emperors, Diocletian, actually succeeded in killing all the pastors, destroying all the Bibles, and destroying all the churches. He did that in 10 years. And there's no complete copy of the Bible before that Roman emperor's time. He destroyed every one. Now what we have is fragments. And we have fragments of their of their apologies. But basically, the early church struggled with Jesus. In fact, if you want to understand theology, if you want to buy a book at a bookstore, a used book, and you want to know if it's conservative or not, check what they think about Jesus. And the church 
swung pendularly between um, Arianism uh, and Eutychianism and Nestorianism and Apollinarianism. Those isms were all heresies where first they said Jesus was all God, 100%, but he was not human. Well, that's a problem because it says in Hebrews 2 that he partakes. In fact, let me show you how, how we get to this. Look at Hebrews 2 with me. You guys are so sweet. You sit there so quietly, staring off into space, waiting for me to show you a verse, okay? Um, look, look at this because it gets into the Trinity because the, the essence of the Trinity is this. Is Jesus totally 100% God? See, that's the whole, there's no, God is God. Nobody's ever had a problem with God being God. You know, the, the God of the Old Testament. Albert Schweitzer believed in that. But he didn't believe Jesus was divine. Most liberals don't. They think he's a good guy, but he's not divine. L look at what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. That was last time when we were talking about, you know, limited atonement. That's an interesting verse. But the, the key is Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. So obviously he was above the angels. Now, look at, at verse 18. For, of the same chapter. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. When, when the pendulum swung this way, um, I think it's called Nestorianism, all these isms, like Arianism, which said Jesus is a created being, was by a man called Arius, and his heresy was called Arianism. Nestorianism, Nestorius, a person, said Jesus is all God, he's not man. Well, then people came and they said, well, what about verse 18? For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Wow. And, and if you read through the, the, the book of Hebrews, uh, keep going in chapter four. It says, uh, in verse 15, for we don't have a high priest who cannot be sympathized with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, the early church could not figure out how Jesus could be divine and still be human. And so they started doing stuff like saying that he is half and half. Um, that was one of the heresies. He's half God, half man. Well, that's a real problem. Because which half of him was God? Was it the half that died? Can God die? Was it the half of him that was tempted? And so, you know, and, and basically by the time we get to um, the, the council at Nicaea and Chalcedon, which the Chalcedonian council was very big, what they came up with was 100% God, 100% man. And that's where we get the confession that he is co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial, God of God, light of lights. If you ever, you know, in the back of the hymn book are all those creeds and confessions and everything. And what they did is they affirmed the fact that the Bible, though it doesn't use the word Trinity, the Bible consistently portrays three distinct persons. God Father, God Son, God Spirit. And I'll show you lots of verses of that. That, that is one God, but he eternally exists in three persons. Well, then we come up with, when did Jesus become the Son? Was he eternally the son or did he become the son? And to show you how complicated this is, you know, my greatest earthly theological hero is John MacArthur. John MacArthur, for a period of time in his life, taught that Jesus became 
the Son at a certain point. Now, the reason he did that is it, it seems to say that in one passage. And the whole theological community came against him. And, you know, and, and he finally, like St. Augustine before him, you ever heard of St. Augustine, Augustine? Augustine, at the end of his life, retracted all of his mistakes. He said, early on, when I was young and writing voluminously, I made several mistakes, and here my mistakes are, and I take them all back. And, and humble John MacArthur later said that, that he wanted to affir affirm the eternal sonship, that Jesus Christ did not... What, what he said is, he was Trinitarian. He always said there was God in three persons, and there was the second person of the Trinity. But he wasn't always the Son, which seems subordinate to the Father. He was co-equal. So he said there was a time he became the Son. And, but then he went back, and later, you can find it online, he retracted that. He said that's a possible interpretation, but it doesn't square with, with historic orthodoxy. So I retract it and reaffirm the eternal sonship. There's another, and I don't know, I sh oh, you know, it's very hard to not go widely, but there's also another doctrine called the procession of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And it's just very complicated, so let's just look at the verses, okay? The first verse I want you to look at is in 1 John, and it probably won't be in most of your Bibles. But look at, at 1 John uh, chapter 5 and verse 7. And, and this will help us see why this controversy has been going for so long. Um, the, the Trinity fills the Scripture. And uh, uh, I have a personal habit of reading repeatedly through the Bible. It's just something that uh, actually, the reason I'm sports challenged is that I made a conscious effort earlier in my life that I want to know more about the Bible than about sports. And so I consciously switched from, you know, to know about sports, you have to watch them all the time, you have to talk about them all the time, you have to first open to the third section of the paper every day, you know what I mean? You have to have the radio, the television on, you have to check it online, and you're just tracking it to keep up. There's just so many myriads of teams and players and, and leagues and everything that you have to devote a section of your mind to that. And I decided when I met this elderly man uh, who taught the Bible so well, I went to him and I said, how do you know the Bible so well? And he says, you have to know the Bible. Uh, you have to master the, the scriptures. And I said, how do you do it? And he says, by continuous repeated readings. And he said, you start by reading the Bible through once for every year you are old and then surpass your age. And so when I was a teenager, I subscribed to that. And so... One of the things I do is, each time I read through the Bible, I study one topic all the way through the Bible. And so one time, uh, and, and I, so far I've studied, um, uh, I think, 92 topics all the way through the Old Testament, because I've read the Old Testament 92 times, and about 120 topics all the way through the New Testament, because I've read the New Testament 120 times. And each time that I read, I look for, and this time, I look for the Trinity one time. And what I did is I read every verse in the Bible, all 31,000, and solely scanned for verses that spoke of the Trinity. Here's one. Look at 1 John 5, which isn't, and I'll explain to you why it isn't in most Bibles. It says in 1 John 5, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. And like um, my Bible says, uh, uh, the mass, let's see, the, the Nestle Uberhart text, the NU text, omits the words from verse 7 through verse 8. And only four or five of the very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. That is one of the clearest examples of why we need to have... Uh, discretion in reading the scripture. That verse doesn't show up anywhere until the 16th century. Isn't that amazing? And when it was presented, that verse was presented by a man named Erasmus who was making the first Greek 
printed Greek text uh, of the New Testament, and the Roman Catholic Church instructed him that there had been so much controversy about the Trinity that they wanted to have a verse, one verse that that's, clears the deck. And so he wrote it. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And church history tells us that when he delivered the manuscript to the Roman Catholic Church, the ink wasn't even dry. Now you say, does that mean that the Trinity is not true? No. It just means that sometimes theologians under pressure try and make things clearer than, than they need to. So how do we know that there's a Trinity? Well, we know it not because of 1 John 5. So if you're sharing with someone, don't use that verse because there's more controversy about it. But let's go to the Old Testament first because a lot of people say the New Testament's corrupted. Did you know that? A lot of people say that. A lot of people whose, whose children were in this church, did you know there are a lot of people who, who have lost their faith that went to church here, that grew up here? And do you know what happens? It's because people start showing them stuff like this, only they don't ever show them the rest of the story. They don't piece it together and they start losing their faith. So let's go to the book of Isaiah and uh, let me start in the 40s somewhere. By the way, I, I never know what they're going to ask. I wish Dale you, and the rest of you, I wish you would have, Douglas Paul, I wish you would have asked me this this morning so I could have thought about it. But look at Isaiah 40. Let me find it here. Uh, 45 somewhere, 40, there are a lot of Trinitarian verses. Here we go, Isaiah 43. Um, the reason I proved the Trinity from the Old Testament is this, and I, I said it this morning, I don't know if you caught it. When Jesus was answering his critics, Jesus answered them from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, Jesus held in his hands and read, we have a copy of it. We have a, an exact copy of the Bible Jesus, that nobody's corrupted, no parts that have, have been redacted by anybody. We have exactly the scriptures that Jesus used. It's called the Septuagint. Jesus read from, quoted, studied, memorized from both the Hebrew and the Greek Bible, the Septuagint. And Jesus affirmed the scriptures. Remember I said this morning, the reason I believe the Bible can be trusted is because Jesus trusted it. And if you get rid of Jesus, then you are hopeless heathen. You are lost. If you can believe in Jesus Christ, there's a lot of other things that can become peripheral. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, believed the book of Isaiah. And look what Isaiah says, starting in Isaiah 43, starting in verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So, lesson number one in the Trinitarian uh, controversy, this verse just blew away the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Did you catch that? The Jehovah's Witnesses, when they come knocking on your door, they're anti-Trinitarian. Jehovah's Witnesses are not really Jehovah's Witnesses. They're Jehovah's false witnesses. So they're JFWs, not JWs. And they hold to Arianism. And Arianism says that Jesus is a God. He is not, Jesus is not God the Son. He is a God. And they even have their New World Translation that they will show you on your doorstep. By the way, if Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses come to your doorstep, the Bible says in 2 John, don't invite them in your house. You want to witness to them, witness to them on the doorstep. Take them to Starbucks. Don't invite them in. Why? Because your nominal Roman Catholic unsaved neighbor over there saw the Jehovah's Witnesses, they've seen them before, and if you who are the person that knows the Lord and talks about them all the time, invites them in, they'll think, oh, those must, be, those must be okay people. So that's why it says in 2 John, if someone comes to your door, 2 John verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, you, you, it's very strong. It says don't, 
If they don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, if they're an Arian uh, or, or any of the other forms of denying the deity of Christ and the triunity of God, it says, don't even let them into your house. And don't say, you know, God bless you as you go, you know, have a safe trip. They are dangerous. It's what you would do if someone came to you ravaged with some bird flu or something, you know. You keep them at a distance and you make it real clear that, that you're going to help them, but you're not going to get what they have. So, this verse, look what it says. It demolishes the Jehovah's Witnesses. It says, before me there is no God form, nor shall there be after me. Do you know what they say? They say that God, the big God, formed Jesus, the little God, the a uh, God. So, God made a God. It's kind of like Mormonism says, you know, we're all gods, and there's Adam God, and Father God, and, you know, and you're a God, and Jesus and Satan are gods, you know. No. Look what it says. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, verse 11, am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. I've declared and saved, proclaimed, and there's no foreign God among you. Indeed, verse 13, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work who will reverse it. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I will send Babylon and bring them down. And he starts talking. And then he says, I'm the Lord, your Holy One. I'm the Creator, your King. So the Lord affirms who he is. Now look across at chapter 44 and look at verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, I and his Redeemer, the Lord God of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me there is no God who can proclaim as I do. And, and he talks about that only God can know the future. Do you notice what he said? Verse 6, I am the first, I am the last. I'm the Redeemer, I'm the Lord of hosts. Who came to this earth and said, I am the first and I am the last. Jesus Christ. See, Jesus ascribed to himself the, the titles of God. We've just been covering that in Revelation. Remember I showed you all those titles two, three weeks ago? Jesus said, I'm the first and the last. I am the Redeemer. Now keep going to, to chapter 48 and verse 16 of Isaiah. Isaiah 48 16, and, and I'll back up to 12, but uh, 16, come near and hear this, Isaiah 48, 16, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was I was there. Now the Lord, God, and his Spirit have sent me. Now just don't, don't leave that verse, you ought to star it. Whoever is talking from 43, where we began onward, keeps saying, I am the first, I am the last, I am the redeemer. I'm going to show you in verse 12, he says, I'm the creator. Whoever is talking says, the Lord God and, so there's one, and a separate entity. Does it say his? Yeah, his, there's... His spirit, in, I'm reading New King James, not sure what, um, what the other versions say, has sent me. Whoa. So whoever's talking is the me. And the me differentiates himself from the Lord God and his spirit. Who is talking? Well, back up to verse 12 and look at this. I, I mean, we could read, I, it, it's so neat to, to read all this, but I, I don't want to bore you and use the whole time up. Listen to me, O Jacob, verse 12, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, 48, 12 says, I am the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. So whoever the me is, he declares that he is the creator. And he says that he is the redeemer. 
Okay, now we can only, now we would slam dunk this if we went immediately to Colossians or John chapter one, you know, any of those places or Revelation because Colossians one says that Jesus is the creator. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Uh, you know, the, the book of Revelation repeatedly says that Jesus is the redeemer. Uh, John 1, 1 and 1 John 1 both say Jesus is the creator, but there are people that believe the New Testament's corrupted. And Jesus affirmed that the Old Testament was not corrupted. So now go from Isaiah to Zechariah. And if you want to know where Zechariah is, just go to Matthew and back up four pages, okay? Um, Zechariah, and I want to show you something very interesting. And remember I told you that, um, that one of my hobbies, you know, is just reading the Bible repeatedly. This is what you get if you just spend however long it takes to read through the whole Bible and look for one point. You begin to see doctrines that permeate the Scripture. So, so let me show you Zechariah chapter 12. This is phenomenal. We're staying in the Old Testament. You can trust the Old Testament. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls that showed that the, the Old Testament has not been corrupted, uh, even a smidgen. The, the, the Bible that was hidden in those caves for 1,900 years is exactly the same one I'm holding in my hand. All the generations and publishers and printing presses didn't corrupt it, neither did all the theologians and schools of theology. It's, it's, it's been preserved. Now look what it says in Zechariah uh, chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the world, or the earth, and forms the spirit of man. That is a powerful verse. Whoever is talking here says that they are the one who stretched out the heavens, the cosmos, who laid the foundation of the geos, you know, geology, the earth, and who puts the spirit, the pneumos. See, it's a little play on words. If you read it in the Septuagint, they all would have asses on the end because it's cosmos, geos, pneumos. It says, that's who's talking. Now, verse 3, it shall be in that day that I, who, whoever this is, in verse 1, is still talking in verse 3. I will do this. Verse 4, and that day says the Lord, and if your Bible does this, you notice it's in all what? What is Lord in right there? Caps. Wow. Did you know that it makes a difference if, if it's spelled like this or if it's spelled like this? This is different than this. The capitalized is one of the most frequent names of God, over 8,000 times, that is his ineffable name. Uh, we can say Yahweh, or you might have heard Jehovah. This is Adonai. They both mean Lord, but this capitalized one is God's personal name. That's the one the Jews wouldn't say out loud. They, that's why we don't even know how to pronounce it, because they wouldn't. And so we're not sure if it's Yahweh or Jehovah, but it's close. We know the consonants, not the vowels. But that's who's talking in verse 4. And that day says the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, the, the one from creation, the one from Moses in the burning bush, him, I will strike every horse and do all that. Look at verse 6. I will make the governors. Verse 7, the Lord. It's capitalized again. Verse 8, the Lord. He's still talking. Verse 9, he's still talking. It shall be in that day I will seek all the nations. Now look at verse 10. Remember in Isaiah 46? In Isaiah 46, that we were briefly at before, Whoever it is talking said, the Lord God and his spirit has sent me to be creator and to be redeemer. So that's Isaiah. That's un, you know, ruined by anybody. And so is Zechariah. And look what he says now in verse 10. And I, same one, 
will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. I, I've enjoyed this so many times. When I fly on airplanes over to Israel, you're always on a plane loaded with Jews, you know, because they're always going to Israel. They love Israel, and they're always trying to get back to the land. And they will be walking up and down the aisles. They're very gregarious, social people. Jewish people are fun and wonderful. And they'll be walking up and down the aisles, and inevitably one will stop, and they'll lean over, and they'll say, oh, what are you doing? Because I have my Bible open. I say, oh, I'm reading the Bible. Oh, they said, you know, they go like this. I go, oh, no, I'm reading the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Mm -mm, why? Oh, I love the Old Testament. You, you love the Old Testament? I go, yeah. Well, they're so friendly. They'll sit right on the arm of your airplane seat. Start talking to you about the Old Testament. As long as you stay in the Old Testament, they're excited. And I say, hey, I have a question for you. Because I've been reading the Bible scores of times, and I've still not been able to figure this out. Could you help me? And actually, what I just showed you, I have, I have marked. You know, all the lords I have circled, and I have down here to the next lord and circled, and to the I circled, and all the way down to the me. And it's just in red pen. And I say, what does that ver verse 10 mean? And you know, most of them have never read the Bible. I mean, they've memorized pieces and they've quoted things in the synagogue, but they've never sat and read it. And they go, and I will pour on the house of David, David, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, spirit of grace and supplication. And they see that they see the Jehovah, I, Lord, I, Lord, caps, Lord, whom they pierced, they get up. They know this is talking about Jesus. Won't talk anymore because it's as clear as day. What we find is who the me is. The me is the one who was pierced. When was God pierced? Only once. Only once. On the cross. How was God pierced? Well, now you know, because I trust the New Testament too. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because the Apostle Paul explains to us a little bit about Trinitarianism and, and discounts this. You see, the Bible, the Bible shows us that there's not one God with three hats. He is not in a mode of being the Father, in a mode of being the Son, in a mode of being the Spirit. All three are in the New Testament especially, all three are operating at the same time. And in the Old Testament, we can see it. But look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it's the verse to it, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. There it is, it's verse 19. That is, God was in Christ reconciling, so this one, Number one here from Isaiah 46 is in number three as number three was being pierced to redeem us. Where was the Holy Spirit? Oh, that's in Hebrews 9. It says how much more, see the New Testament pieces the Trinity together all the time. Hebrews 9 says this, that what Paul said there in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, Paul said, God was in Christ as Jesus was hanging on the cross like this, with his arms outstretched. God was inside him looking out at the world through his outstretched arms. And what was he doing? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their, trans their trespasses to them, and he committed to us the word of reconciliation. And verse 21, he made him. Who? Number one here made number three to become sin for us because number three knew no sin. He was perfect, holy, harmless, undefiled, made separate from sinners. 100% God. But he was 100% man, and that 100% man became sin for us 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So where was the Holy Spirit? Well, turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. And here's the Holy Spirit. Here's all three of them. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Chapter 9, verse 14. How much more then shall the blood of Christ, that's the me, Christ, how much more shall the blood of Christ, number three, who through the eternal spirit, number two, here the Holy Spirit is called the eternal spirit, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to whom? God, number one. They're all three operating at once. You can find this, I mean, we could spend all night, there are so many verses where you see not a mode where he's fathering, he's sonning, he's Holy Spiriting, but he's just one person with three modes. We see one God eternally existing in these three persons that are co-equal, co-substantial. They cannot be, you know, you can't divide them off and say that this portion of the eternal God is not the Holy Spirit. He is co-substantial. They're all, all God. But they have, they have specific roles. Just like in man and woman. We are equal, but we have gender-specific roles. It doesn't mean woman is less than man or man is more than woman. But by our gender, we have roles God has laid down. Within the Trinity, the Lord God is the Father. He is always presented as the Father. Now, there's another heresy. It's called patrapashianism. And what that means is that it was God who died on the cross. No, the Bible says, number three, me, Christ, the Son, died on the cross. But 2 Corinthians 5 says God was in Christ. Reconcil not dying. God the Father didn't die. God the Son died. Now, you, I'm glad you didn't ask me that question because that's impossible to answer. But one more um, let's go back to the Old Testament, look at Psalm 2, and I just want to show you, uh, you can get a complete theology, and if you ever, if you come from a Jehovah's Witness background, or Mormon background, or a liberal background, and you're still wondering about the Trinity, you ought to take 72 hours. That's all it takes to read the whole Bible. And I've already told you that's like 24 games. It's like 36 movies. How many movies have you watched in your life? How many times have you read the Bible? Shows what's more important to us, right? You can read the whole Bible in 72 hours, and if you ever are concerned about the Trinity, just read it all the way through and just mark it. Look at chapter 2. It, it, it's so amazing. Uh, I mean, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? The people plot. I'm in verse 1. The kings set themselves and take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So immediately we have two persons, two distinct entities. There's the Lord, and the word anointed is in Hebrew, Mashiach, which in Greek is Christos, which is translated Christ. So we have Christ right there, the, his anointed, and we have the capitalized number one here, Jehovah. Now look, look at Verse 7, I will declare the decree that the Lord has said to me. See, this is, this is the key. There aren't very many people that argue about the Holy Spirit. It's Christ that they have trouble with. It's because of all the false teaching that the New Testament manuscripts were corrupted and a bunch of schools of theology made the deity of Christ and they read it into the Gospels. And if you want to read it, it's just a whole bunch of just hogwash online. What they're trying to do is they're trying to undermine the deity of Jesus Christ. Nobody really cares that the Holy Spirit's divine. 
I mean theologically. It's Christ. He's the linchpin. Because if Jesus is not divine, you don't have a trinity. If Jesus is not divine, you don't have this Old Testament God showing up in the New Testament saying few are going to heaven. You have this milk toast weakling that, that just said all nice stuff and doesn't talk about hell. That was all added with the deity stuff. Jesus Christ deity is the key. And, and whether it's modalism or Arianism or any of these other isms, Trinitarianism is not fighting for three persons as much as it is trying to defend the deity of this one, the third person in Isaiah, the second person of the Trinity. And I could go through the New Testament, you can look it up yourself, but right there, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, Psalm 2, 7. Who is the son of God? He is verse 2, the anointed one. In the Old Testament, God, the Lord, with all caps, declared that he was going to have a son who was the anointed one, who was equal with the other two members of the Trinity, who was the Lord that was pierced. You can't divide the God part from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is as much God as the Father. Jesus Christ is as much God as the Spirit. And the Father is as much God as the Son. That's what co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial, indivisible means. The word Trinity you will never find in the Bible until Erasmus does another edition and writes it in for us. But we don't need him to. The doctrine of the Trinity starts in Genesis when the Lord said, let us make man in what? Our. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters as God the Son, the Creator here, created everything from nothing for the glory of the Father who sat enthroned at creation, it says in Psalm 29. So during creation, God was sitting on the throne. The Holy Spirit was hovering around and Jesus was speaking into existence the universe. From Genesis to Revelation, there's one God, but he constantly exists in all three persons. None of the three ever cease to exist or pull a hat off like in modalism. So, and good, we have four minutes left to answer the other two. There is a new heaven and a new earth. You can read about it in Revelation 21, and I'll pick up there, Tom, next time, but Revelation 21 tells us something interesting that I want you to go home and think about. There are two words for new in the, in the New Testament. There's new of the same kind. There's new of a different kind. If I have a favorite pair of shoes, I love these shoes. This is the third new pair of the exact same pair of shoes. I like them so much that I get exactly the same, only ones that the heels aren't worn off and the leather's not worn out. So they're new of the same kind. And so when I say I'm getting new shoes, you say, well, they look exactly the same. They're not the same shoes, but they look exactly the same. The new heavens is the word for new of the same kind. The best thing to know about the new heavens and the new earth is you already know what it's going to be like. It's going to be like the best of everything in this world. Um, we, we were with Estelle, and Estelle said, you know what, uh, down in Honduras, she said, did you know if you stick your head in the water and look through my little mask here, she said, you'll see the second most beautiful reef in the world. I said, really? Honduras has, off its coast, the second largest reef with sea creatures. And so I put the mask on and I looked in and I couldn't believe it. And I, and I stuck my head under 
And the first time I've ever seen in my life, I saw a tornado of fish. There is this trench that goes down. There must have been 100,000, 200,000 of them, and they were swimming like this, like a tornado. They were just swimming as fast as they could like this, going down. And I just watched that, and I thought, wow. Do you know what heaven's going to be like? It's going to be like the beauty, the perfection of anything you like here. Like if you ever watched the Planet Earth BBC series, and it talks about how incredible the earth is. When you get to heaven, I can assure you that the sky is going to be not green. It's not going to look like Alderaan, you know, in science fiction. There aren't going to be, you know, two suns. You know, it's the, the sky is going to look like the sky. The water is going to look like the water. The plants are going to look like the water because the heaven that we're going to is exactly like earth, only it's new, but it's the same. It's not new, different. It's not like God's going to have blue grass. You've got to keep asking what that stuff is. It's new of the same, and the same with the earth. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And you say, well, how can an 8,000 mile in diameter, that's the diameter of the earth, how can it have a 1,200 mile cube sitting on it? Because that's the new Jerusalem, heaven. Coming down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem is 1,200 miles by 1,200 by 1,200 by 1,200, and we live in that thing. That's where our home is, in the new Jerusalem. But it comes down to earth. Why do we think it can't sit on a revolving, 1,000 mile an hour revolving planet? Because the God who created it put physical laws in that said a 1,200 mile cube can't sit on an 8,000 mile diameter, you know, spinning globe. But who wrote physics? God. So he's going to make it work. And so there is a lot of stuff, Mr. Tibble, that I don't understand. Uh, I don't understand how many animals are in heaven. The only ones we're sure of are horses, not dogs. Dogs are outside heaven, you dog lovers. It says that in Revelation 21, outsider dogs. But uh, we will pick up there, and uh, that was a joke, you know. But um, new heavens and new earth, we can talk about. Dale, you ask yours first. You're going to have to wait the longest because I have to think more about this because um, I don't want to step on any toes. But basically, I'll say in this, and I have 30 seconds to say it, repeatedly in the Scriptures, Jesus says something that you should think about. Jesus says, if the people who lived in Tyre and Sidon had heard what you're hearing, Capernaum, they would have repented. If the people in Sodom and Gomorrah had heard what you heard, Bethsaida, they would have repented. Do you know what the Bible says? Jesus, in his sovereignty, also knows what we could call potentiality, he already knows. It's like the chess game where before the game starts, he knows every move that can be made and he knows every possible move and before you even move them, he knows them all. But he also says, if you would have done this, I would have done this. There's something within God's sovereignty that compensates not to any lessening of his absolute omniscience and omnipotence but within his sovereignty because he knows every single move it appears and this is what Dale's talking about there appears to be a channel and within that channel you can make any choice you want it's not like God says eh! that's it there appears to be within his sovereign plan, he allows latitude. It's interesting. And, and I'll tell you, there's tons of verses that have that in the Bible, but don't be worried. We affirm the sovereignty of God and that he is so sovereign, if man has any free will, he gave it to him. Okay? Let's all stand and uh, before you all faint and uh, let's thank the Lord uh, that he is eternally existing in three persons so that the me could get pierced for me and for you.
Because the only way we could be saved is for a perfect, infinite being to offer one sacrifice in six hours that would cover the effect of sin for eternity that need to be paid for. That's why you have to have a divine son or we can't be saved. So let's bow together before him. Father, we do bow before you. And like I told that young man this morning that was visiting, so sweetly he came through the line and he said, I don't have what you talked about this morning. I've been baptized, but I sure never got all those things. And Lord, I pray that he would realize, as I told him, that only falling at your feet and crying out in desperation and hopeless lostness that you, O oh Christ, who were pierced for us, are our only hope. And I pray that all of us would realize that, like we started, we're not supposed to be fearing the future and our health and our finances and whether someone's going to ambush us when we're on a missions trip or on vacation. But rather, we would see that as long as we walk every day in step with your Spirit, that every disaster that comes our way is part of your wonderful plan and that you are going to be glorified through us and that you've already written down the day of our departure. And we have an appointment and no one can, can interfere with that appointment. No terrorist and no cancer and no prowler can get us until you want us to come home. So I pray we would fear not and I pray that we'd excitedly look forward to our new heaven that's just like this one and the new earth that's just like this one. And I pray that we'd realize that you do give us choices and we're going to eternally be grateful for the choices we make in step with your spirit and we're going to regret the ones we made not in step with your spirit. So help us to live for you and tune with you through your word for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a good evening.